welcome everybody to the webinar of today. The speaker of today is uh, Filippo Coletti, and uh, he is going to talk about uh, particles and snowflakes falling through turbulence. Uh, as usual, I introduce the speaker for uh, uh, for a minute, quite briefly, and then I leave him the floor. Uh, so, Filippo Coletti is professor of experimental fluid dynamics at ETH Zurich. Uh, where he has been uh, since 2020. Uh, previously, he was uh, McKnight uh, Land Grant Associate Professor of Aerospace Engineering um, and uh, Mechanics at the uh, University of Minnesota, which he joined in 2014. He performed his uh, doctoral uh, studies at the uh, von Karman Institute of Fluid Dynamics and at the University of Stuttgart, uh, where he obtained his PhD in 2010. He was postdoctoral fellow at Stanford University between 2011 and 2013. Uh, his research interests are uh, focused on uh, particle laden flows, which he studies uh, with a wide spectrum of experimental approaches and with uh, applications to environmental, biomedical, and industrial problems. He is recipient of an NSF uh, career award in 2015 and an ERC consolidator grant in 2022. So it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Filippo Coletti for the webinar of today. So Filippo, I stop sharing my screen and uh, you can start sharing yours. Thank you very much, Francesco, for the very kind invitation, very kind introduction and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Assuming it is afternoon on your time zone, but I guess we are, well, most of us in the same time zone. Um, I actually see several several names uh, uh, that I didn't expect to see. Uh, a friend of mine uh, who are connected, so I guess uh, uh, kudos to Francesco for advertising the seminar. Uh, and uh, um, it's a pleasure to uh, give this talk uh, um, to this audience. I actually uh, remember visiting uh, uh, Lille, uh, I guess back when it was called LML, uh, when I was a graduate student at the von Karman Institute in, in Brussels and I took a train to uh, to see the, the big soufflerie. I have very good memories. Um, and generally, it's a pleasure to talk about my, my research uh, online. Uh, we'll do it, I guess, uh, next time I, 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 I wish to see uh, uh, some of you in person. All right, so today we're going to talk about uh, particles in, in turbulence. And particles uh, in general are uh, essential to process engineering, of course, but they're also uh, capable of uh, impacting negatively uh, energy harvesting devices. Particles can also come from large objects that can uh, degrade and pollute our waters irreversibly. Um, and of course, the sky offers countless examples of uh, particles in turbulence. And finally, the pandemic has made clear how small particles suspended in air can, can rule our lives. So what we do in, in my group is to investigate particles in turbulence, in fact, uh, over a wide range of concentration of regimes. Uh, the, the challenges really increase substantially when you move from low particle volume fractions. When I say low, I mean really low, uh, 10 to the minus six, uh, uh, even less uh, volume fractions. This would be uh, actually the regime. So we would talk about mostly today here on the left. But then we also look at a uh, situation like, like liquid sprays or particle plumes, where the concentration can be uh, 10 or 100 times larger. But then even uh, fluidized beds or large sediments, where really we're getting into the dense regimes in which uh, collisions between particles can, can be not only important, but even, even though. But today we will stay on the simple side, on the left hand side of this, this spectrum. And in fact, uh, um, I'll give you a little, a little exam, uh, a little uh, open note, open book exam. I hope uh, you guys are ready. Um, so consider a, a dilute suspension of spherical solid particles, the fall in a turbulent fluid flow. The particle density is known and the diameter is also known. And we know all the properties of the fluid flow in which the particles are, are falling, statistically and otherwise. And I'm gonna make it easy for you. The particles are so small and they're so sparse that they have essentially no effect or negligible effect on the, on the fluid flow. Then I have only one question. What is the full speed of the particles? And this seemingly simple problem is, is a problem actually that uh, has impacted my own life in ways that I would have not imagined uh, when I was growing up as a, as a kid in, in Perugia, Italy. Um, 
because that's a, a satellite view uh, of uh, the polar vortex uh, hitting North America, and in particular hitting Minneapolis, which used to be uh, my home for about six years. And when that happens, a uh, copious amount of uh, snow precipitation fall on, on you. And, and this is a, a photo uh, taken from the inside of my house. This is my own uh, balcony uh, uh, with about a meter of snow locking me inside with my children. And if you've ever been locked down with, uh, with uh, children, you know that things can go uh, south pretty quickly. But despite, you know, besides my uh, personal struggles with the, with the topic, uh, I think it uh, should be uh, obvious that uh, the, the, knowing the, the snowfall speed uh, is, is a basic quantity. And in fact, um, we can really ask ourselves whether we know the snowfall speed. And it is, to me, was shocking to realize that current models of snowfall, uh, snowfall speed can often be traced to a single empirical study uh, from 1974 based on 376 snowflakes. And that's a problem. It's a problem because, uh, of course, that's not su sufficient to uh, claim that we have a predictive understanding and a real knowledge of the uh, speed with which uh, snowflakes ca uh, fall in the, in the turbulent atmosphere. And, and it's crucial to know, on the other hand, what this fall speed is, because it happens to be a crucial uh, parameter uh, for the determination of climate sensitivity in the climate projector models. And this is the uh, IPCC panel uh, opinion. 2015. All right, so going back to our very simple fundamental problem, just a little bit of background of inertial particles in turbulence. And I, I really uh, believe that most of you are, are familiar, or more, more than familiar. Some of you are even experts on the topic, but I'm just going to, for the purpose of completeness, give a couple of definitions. So we have particle uh, scales and turbulence scales, because these are the two ingredients uh, at hand. So particle diameter and particle response time. And then we have the scales of the turbulence, which of course they, they span the full spectrum from a cosmograph to the integral scales in, in a space and in time. And uh, from the beginning, we know that we're gonna take the simple approach of considering particles which are smaller than the cosmograph scales. So geometric effects are probably negligible. And then we can define as important parameters, this, this uh, uh, so very famous Stokes number, uh, tau p over uh, either tau eta or, or, uh, or tl, depending on uh, the uh, scale, the temporal scale that you choose, the smallest or the largest, or potentially everything in between in turbulence. Now, uh, Stokes eta is typically the, 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 the most common choice. And when uh, Stokes eta is of order one, uh, there is a, a vast uh, literature uh, that uh, claims that particles would uh, be attracted by high strain regions and be uh, centrifuged out of uh, uh, vortical regions, and in general, they will cluster, uh, uh, meaning that they will not disperse homogeneously in space, but in fact, that they will form regions of high concentrations and regions of uh, low concentration. But of course, we are missing gravity. Uh, when there is gravity, uh, there's a natural uh, velocity scale, which is the uh, terminal velocity of the particle will reach if the fluid is perfectly still, and that's just tau p times g, uh, we'll sometimes call this W naught in, in the, the talk today. And we can compare that with the velocity scales of the turbulence. So again, Kolmogorov and the energetic velocity. So in this case, the RMS velocity fluctuation. So just like for the Stokes number, we can define a settling velocity parameter also uh, based on either Kolmogorov scale or uh, the large scale uh, velocity. Now, the question that we have is how does turbulence affect the settling velocity? Uh, we could uh, foresee enhanced settling, or we, we could foresee reduced settling. So either an increase or a decrease of the fall speed uh, based on the, uh, or due to the uh, presence of the turbulence. Now, uh, among the mechanisms that could cause an unsettling, Wang and Maxi proposed uh, preferential sweeping, meaning that particles would favor downward side of uh, at this, and essentially would fast track their way down uh, along the path of minimum resistance. But there are also mechanisms that could cause reduced settling. Uh, for example, there could be vortex trapping if the particle is uh, uh, very weakly inertial and can really be trapped in a vortex. Or there can be low iterating if the particle is, uh, in fact, uh, heavily inertial. And then it just mostly, I would say, bullets through the turbulence and then it spends more time fighting the upward side of the vortex rather than uh, speeding up through the downward side of the vortex. 
And then because the uh, drag is nonlinear, uh, I guess, especially for particles which are uh, heavily in the nonlinear regime, then the uh, upper and downward fluctuations would have different effects and the upper fluctuations would increase uh, the slip velocity more. And so they will have, because of the nonlinear drag effect, they would uh, really cause more of a slowdown and so reduce the cycle. Well, of course, then it's not clear which one will be the dominant uh, effects. Uh, and then, of course, we could uh, think of simulating the full process. And this is, of course, uh, been followed uh, extensively. I guess the classic point particle approach uh, takes the, the some version of the full Maxi Riley Gatignol equation, which I'm putting up here, but I have no intention to, to uh, dissect uh, here for you, but essentially a form of Newton's law, meaning that the, the particle mass and the particle acceleration is balanced by uh, all the forces uh, acting on, on a particle in a generic fluid flow, um, uh, non-uniform and non-steady. But of course, there are strong, strong assumptions behind this uh, relatively simple uh, model. Uh, the model here assumes the particle is vanishingly small, and also the, the slip velocity is small because uh, the Reynolds number uh, based on the particle diameter and the slip velocity should be uh, very small for the uh, equation to strictly apply. And then the particle should not alter the fluid flow, or if it does, then for the purpose of calculating drag, uh, uh, according to the uh, Stokesian uh, picture, we should really know the undisturbed fluid velocity, and that is not something that is really a given. So, of course, there are uh, obstacles to the uh, application of this of this equation. And in fact, uh, even in relatively simple situations like homogeneous turbulence with monodispersed particles falling through it, small particles, uh, one has a very hard time matching data with, uh, with simulations, simulations that follow this type of approach. Uh, this is a paper, uh, a beautiful paper, in fact, uh, with a combination of numerical simulations and experiments from uh, Cornell and uh, Max Planck Institute in Göttingen. And, and as you can see here, the, the vertical velocity W of the particle normalized by the uh, still fluid vertical velocity W naught is plotted against the uh, large scale version of the certain velocity parameter. And as you can see, the, the, the gaps are, are substantial. There can be a easily a factor two of, of mismatch in between the predictions and the laboratory observations for matching conditions, at least in, in, in principle. And then the other end of the spectrum is a fully particle resolved approach in which now the, the um, mesh really resolves the details of the flow around the particles. There is no need to model any force if one, of course, resolves all the scales at play. But uh, this is a beautiful uh, uh, technique and idea because it gives incredible uh, deep, incredibly deep access to all sorts of uh, properties and, and mechanisms. Except, of course, it's uh, very computationally expensive. So there are stringent limits, even with the today's supercomputing capabilities, in terms of the number of particles, the Reynolds number of the particles, and the Reynolds number of the turbulence that one can access. Which is why uh, someone like me, who's experimentalist at heart, um, uh, tackles this problem doing, of course, laboratory experiments, making no assumption, of course, uh, that's the, the beauty of, of the experiments on the governing equations. Um, to uh, uh, have as clear of a view as possible, we try to minimize uh, confounding factors, meaning that we try to have uh, spherical particles, monodispersed particles, so that we don't have to worry uh, about uh, knowing very well the, the properties of our particles. Um, and then we focus on canonical turbulent flows. In fact, I'll spend most of my time today talking about homogeneous uh, and quasi-isotropic turbulence. And then we try to really measure everything, uh, or at least as much as we can, meaning that we uh, uh, perform uh, um, fluid uh, turbulence measurements, uh, uh, trying to resolve all scales from the integral down to the Kolmogorov, and in space and in time, and we track position uh, of the particles in time. So to get Lagrangian trajectories with velocity and accelerations, um, again, resolving, uh, or at least attempting to resolve all the spatial and temporal scales at play. Uh, and we do that because we aim at a predictive understanding, of course, of the process. So we really try to uh, come up with a, a mechanistic picture of what was happening. But I guess the very big picture is to reach uh, uh, an understanding of what the minimal physics uh, we need to retain if you want to understand this, uh, this uh, process without uh, uh, recurring to brute force. And our workhorse is uh, turbulence chamber. 
this is zero mean flow apparatus in which we generate uh, homogeneous turbulence over a large volume. Uh, the way we do it is, is very simple, at least uh, it's very simple in a PowerPoint cartoon, meaning that we take a large volume, uh, as big as, a, as an elevator, let's say, um, and we uh, have two arrays of jets uh, that produce, uh, uh, that pulse at, at uh, times, uh, at intervals that we control. And this creates a large region of homogeneous turbulence in which we drop inertial particles. And then we shine a light sheet, a laser sheet, and we look at it with one or multiple cameras. And the, there, you, there you have it. We have our, our beautiful experiments. Of course, in real life, it's slightly more complicated. Uh, this is a CAD drawing of the actual facility, which we built at the University of Minnesota. And a, a new one is, is, is being built here at the TH Zurich. It's a, about a five cubic meter chamber with the 256 uh, computer controlled jets. Uh, the chamber is fully transparent, so we have a, a, a nice optical access. And this is a, a picture, uh, an actual photo and a close-up view of the jet array. Um, uh, then we shine uh, lasers, uh, either high-speed uh, lasers, uh, um, if we uh, want to resolve all temporal scales, like coupled with the um, uh, high-speed cameras. Today, I'll show uh, results which we took typically around 5 kilohertz. Um, otherwise, for the time average uh, results, uh, sometimes we just perform uh, double post. Uh, uh, basically, we go for double post lasers for standard PIV. Of course, in that case, we, we try to maximize the spatial resolution. And that's just a picture of me uh, with uh, the one student in my uh, group in Minnesota that made me look tall, uh, Lucy, one of my uh, uh, favorite students uh, for, for many reasons. She kindly accepted to. Uh, was for, for this funny picture when we inaugurated the, um, the chamber a few years back. And then, of course, we draw particles in, in the chamber. And again, these are size selective particles. We typically use glass beads, uh, but sometimes we also use lycopodium spores, which are beautifully size selected by nature. Uh, they figured out that 30 micron is the ideal size for them to, for this type of spore to reproduce. So it's, it's pretty amazing how narrowly distributed they are uh, in nature, and you can actually acquire quite a large amount of them. Uh, for not a very high high cost. And we drop them through a vertical chute a few meters long, such that they reach terminal velocity before entering the uh, homogeneous uh, tur the turbulent regions in the, uh, in the chamber. And uh, because we, have, uh, we can tune uh, our uh, turbulence intensity, so our time scales of the, uh, and velocity scales of the turbulence, but also we can use multiple type of uh, particles, we can uh, play with the range of Stokes number and SB number, those are the two control parameters we have. But I guess uh, we also have another control parameter, which is the volume fraction. And we do span a fairly wide range of volume fraction, uh, 10 to the minus seven, that will be uh, fully one-way coupled according to, to the most common view, meaning that uh, we don't expect any back reaction of the particle or any measurable back reaction of the particles on the fluid. Uh, but then we, we push the volume fraction all the way to uh, almost 10 to the minus four, where we do expect uh, substantial uh, two-way coupling, so sub substantial effect on the particles of the particle on the turbulence, and that will show exactly that later. And then we perform uh, multi-phase uh, imaging, um, meaning that we um, uh, image both uh, tracers and inertial particles. So in this video, you can make up, make out, I guess in the zoom better, you can make out uh, both of these uh, bigger and brighter particles, those are inertial particles. For example, this one would be a 50 micron a glass bead. And then the, the smaller and dimmer uh, particles, those are tracers. Those are a one micron uh, olive oil droplets, which are uh, perfectly following the, the fluid flow. And then we separate our, our images into particles only, tracers only, so we can perform a particle tracking velocimetry on the former and particle image velocimetry on the latter. And then, uh, we can so get uh, particle position, velocity, and acceleration. So a full Lagrangian information from the uh, particle tracking velocity, so from the PTV. Whereas from the uh, from the traces, we get the Eulerian field, so fluid velocity, but also vorticity. In this case, there's an animation of strain rate. So we do get a large amount of data, as you can imagine, uh, running at high speed. Uh, this is uh, uh, easily terabytes of data every long measurement campaign, um, and so we need a parallelize. Uh, algorithms on parallelized routines uh, running on computer clusters to be able to process all this data in a, in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, just a quick look at the turbulence characteristic. This is a, 
um, facility in which we can uh, reach up to 550 more or less Reynolds Lambda. So this is substantial enough to uh, reach definitely a, a certain scale separation between the dissipative and the uh, and the integral scales. The uh, integral scale itself is of the order of 10 centimeter. That also depends on uh, the sequence in which we uh, uh, actuate our jets. Uh, and then the RMS velocity fluctuations are of the order of one meter a second, a little bit, little bit less. Also depend, of course, on how we run our our uh, our uh, jet firing routine, which I'm not going to describe in detail. But this, of course, is something I'm I'm happy to to talk about if anyone is interested. And then we uh, obtain a very large, I would say, region of homogeneous turbulence, less than a cubic meter, but still, uh, importantly, much larger than the integral scale of the turbulence. So we 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 guarantee uh, a natural uh, evolution of the turbulence uh, in the Kolmogorov cascade sense, and this is something that we have uh, characterized in the single phase uh, installation uh, in, in several papers. Now, talking about clustering, we uh, perform all sorts of uh, uh, characterization of the particle spatial distribution. I guess one of our favorite tool is the one proposed by uh, uh, Monchot uh, and Michael Bourguin and, and colleagues in 2010 that we have uh, utilized extensively in the past. If you're not familiar with it, it's, it's absolutely a, a beautiful uh, technique you take in, in a 2D image, for example, you take uh, your particle uh, uh, scatter here and you produce a Voronoi tessellation, which means that now each particle is surrounded by a polygon. Um, it has the simple property that all points within the polygon are closer to that particle than to any other particle. So now uh, particles which are very close to each other uh, will have a small polygon around them and, and vice versa. Particles which are uh, far from each uh, from from other particles will live in much larger uh, domains, and so uh, you can find in various ways, uh, simple ways, in fact, a mean to uh, to decide the threshold below which uh, the Voronoi size is uh, implies a clustered particle. So essentially, a concentration tra threshold above which you have a cluster particle, and you can even find individual clusters, so contiguous regions, contiguous uh, uh, um, polygons of uh, Voronoi cells that are uh, below the threshold of size, so above the threshold concentration. And so we can find individual clusters, and it was really striking to us how wide the range of cluster sizes can be. Uh, historically, clusters uh, have been believed to be uh, of order of a few Kolmogorov, but in fact, uh, there is a full range, I would say power law, uh, range of uh, cluster sizes, in this case, cluster areas, reaching and exceeding 10 to the 5 Kolmogorov square. Uh, so in fact, the one you're seeing here, the one in red, is about 30 centimeters in size. So it's about the size of my head, and it's falling in, in this turbulent flow. Um, and the, the, uh, there are different theories on, on uh, what dictates the, the power law there, but the fact that there is a power law is a strong hint to the fact that uh, these clusters are produced by a self-similar process, which in fact uh, very well could be the, the, the turbulence itself, which has a self-similar sub sub nature in, in many senses. But what we're really after here is the particle full speed. So from our Lagrangian trajectories, we get, of course, the, the vertical velocity information. And uh, here I'm gonna plot it in a scatter plot, um, in a domain made out by the Stokes number and the SV number. Those are the two control parameters. And I will plot uh, points of different color depending on the settling velocity normalized by the uh, uh, still fluid settling velocity. So W naught is the settling velocity that we expect in, a, uh, in, in quiescent air. And we can show that it's actually the uh, tau PG, so the uh, settling velocity the particle have in quiescent air. So what we see is that for relatively large Stokes numbers and SV numbers of order 10 or larger, uh, we essentially have more or less the same settling velocity uh, that we would have in quiescent air. And that's probably not surprising because the particles are massive enough that they don't really respond a whole lot to the, uh, to the turbulent uh, perturbation. And then we get closer to, uh, uh, I guess we get smaller in terms of uh, Stokes number and SV numbers. So these are less massive particles. And you see there is a substantial increase there, I guess a 30, 40% increase of settling velocity compared to the uh, terminal velocity in the still fluid, in this case, still air condition. And then we have the straight point over there for a, a Stokes number as, and SV number smaller than one, for which you have a twice as fast settling velocity 
Um, uh, so that, that looked like an outlier, but that definitely is not an outlier because if we ha look at these uh, large uh, uh, sets of, of data um, for Stokes number and SV number, both of order one, uh, those are definitely uh, along the same lines. Those are uh, those have a settling velocity two or even two and a half times or a bit more larger than in still air. This is a, a gigantic increase of settling velocity, something that is really uh, harder to uh, foresee just from, from first principle or from theoretical arguments. Now, the um, mechanism that we believe is, is responsible, at least in part, for, for this great enhancement of settling velocity is just the preferential sweeping that Maxi, uh, Wang and Maxi proposed in the 90s. Um, I already alluded to it. Now, the, basically, this is the, the very cartoon that uh, Wang and Maxi uh, um, depicted in, in their JFM in 93. And as you can see, the, the trajectory of the particle from A to B and downward uh, is, uh, is uh, favoring the downward regions of the, of the flow. So we expect that if we look at the fluid velocity at the particle location, well, that should be uh, typically pointing downward. So the vertical component should be negative. And that's exactly what we see. Uh, we have a very highly, a fairly highly resolved uh, fluid uh, information uh, that we can interpolate at the particle location. So that would be our WF, uh, so fluid vertical velocity at XP at the particle location, ensemble average and normalized in this case by the uh, RMS fluctuation of the uh, fluid velocity. And as you can see, it's always negative, but it's much more negative for those Stokes number of order one that as we have seen, tend to uh, really strengthen, maximize this enhanced settling behavior. So this is to us a strong indication that preferential sweeping mechanism is at least consistent with, um, with uh, the enhanced settling that we, that we find. And it is striking to see that the, the clusters, uh, in fact, also uh, give a, 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 an interesting indication of the run settling velocity. Here we're showing the uh, vertical velocity of the, cluster, of the clusters normalized by the uh, uh, settling velocity of all particles, uh, whether they are clusters or not. And uh, as you can see, if the clusters are small, then we are more or less uh, at the same level as, as a part as the particles that are not clustered, but beyond, beyond a certain threshold, the very large clusters uh, almost explode. They really have an extremely large uh, uh, fall speed, which might indicate that we are looking at the two-way coupling of the uh, large dense regions of particles, or we may be looking at the manifestation of, of preferential sweeping, but uh, I won't get into, into this question right now. Now, um, something that has been interesting me for, for a while uh, is, is well, in fact, has been interesting the community for a very long time, is whether particles modify turbulence. And uh, just because I'm asking the question, it's obvious that they, they do modify the turbulence um, in certain conditions. Uh, specifically, uh, there are um, various mechanisms that have been postulated by which particles can, in fact, inhibit turbulence. Um, they could uh, increase the effective density of the uh, particle uh, fluid mixture, then increase the viscosity of it. And in both cases, it will be harder to essentially mobilize the fluid or I guess uh, make it reach that, the, those unstable conditions that really uh, we, we uh, look at uh, as turbulence. And in fact, there is obviously an effect of also dissipation around individual particles. So all these mechanisms have been postulated to be uh, responsible for uh, quenching of turbulence by the particle. But just as many other mechanisms which we expect would augment, augment uh, would increase the turbulence level when particles are there. Particles can release their kinetic energy onto the fluid. Uh, they may have wake, uh, which are energetic enough to uh, inject energy in the fluid, depending, of course, on, on their uh, particle Reynolds number. And in general, they could produce some instability by essentially density gradients, especially when they, they, they cluster. But the result is that in the face of uh, all this uh, uh, plethora of mechanisms that could do either of these things, uh, our understanding is, is at least uh, there was the assessment in 2010 by uh, Balachander and John Eaton. Uh, let's just say that our understanding is very incomplete, uh, even, even poor, uh, definitely open for further fundamental investigation. Um, and, and this is uh, me uh, doing something that at the beginning uh, really, really worried me, which is to make a, a direct one-to-one -one comparison uh, between uh, my results and the results of my uh, postdoc advisor. Um, I don't know if you've ever done something like that. Um, you know, I advise against it. Um, 
uh, just kidding. Uh, the, the point is that when you uh, look at the literature and the, the, one of the main references is your postdoc advisor that you, uh, of course, uh, greatly respect, admire, and, and love in many ways, then finding a very different result uh, can, be, can, be, can be striking, right? Can be something that you have to uh, somehow cope with. Um, and I guess just as, a, as an added joke, I'll put here that uh, I'm, a, of course, a proud member of the Eton Group alumni. Uh, we do put the mental in experimental fluid mechanics. This is a, a mug that we did uh, years ago when I was when I was at Stanford. But fortunately, uh, this uh, this uh, comparison is not, uh, as I believe, nothing to do with uh, um, me doing. Uh, I hope not bad experiments, or definitely not uh, Eton Group doing bad experiments. But it's doing with the fact uh, is dealing with is uh, has to do with the fact that uh, this problem of particle laden turbulence with two way coupling has many parameters at play. In particular, here you can see that the Stokes number of this experiment of uh, uh, Paris and Eton in, in 2000 had the largest Stokes number of about 50, whereas uh, the data I'm showing here on the right, which show the opposite trend, has a Stokes number of about uh, one. So what I'm showing here, as you can see, is the turbulent kinetic energy um, normalized by the one of the same flow without particles. And as you can see, it drops uh, pretty steeply uh, when we increase mass fraction. So this is clearly, uh, um, turbulence uh, reduction, whereas we find absolutely the opposite trend. Uh, we find that as we increase particle mass fraction, um, the turbulent kinetic energy uh, uh, increases. And, and you see the increase is not small. The decrease uh, for Paris and Eton was large, was about uh, an order of magnitude, but it is also an increase of factor uh, two and a half, almost three for us. So those are uh, really remarkable effects. Um, what I think is that just looking at turbulent kinetic energy might not be a good way to look at the problem at all, or at least not a complete way. In fact, uh, if I look at the second order structural function, I see clearly that um, uh, as I increase the volume fraction, there is a profound modification of the structure of the turbulence beyond just the uh, global uh, TKE value. Uh, the energy at different scales is um, affected differently. Particles uh, seems to suck energy at the large scales, and as you can see, the the, the, the reduction of the of the structural function value for large separations, whereas uh, the particles, same particles, really inject a strong amount of energy at the small scales. And what we believe, and as you can see, this is a, uh, this fan increases with the, with the volume fraction. What we really believe is that this process is strongly dependent on whether the particles are clustered like the ones we are considering with the Stokes number of order one, or they are quasi-ballistic, like the particles that uh, Eton and, and, and his group were looking at. All right, so after this parenthesis on, on the two-way coupling, I, I really wanna give you a sense of what we did uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, proving to ourselves that uh, what we are doing in the lab can be really considered directly relevant to what happen, what's happening out there, specifically for, for snow. In fact, are snowflakes just inertial particles in turbulence? After all, they are they're small, small enough to be comparable to the scales of the turbulence. Uh, they are not ballistic, they are not hailstones, they don't fall like bullets from the sky, uh, but they are not uh, light enough to obey the smallest fluctuations of the turbulence. So they should really behave a bit like inertial particles in turbulence. And we investigated that in, in, in some detail uh, when I was in Minneapolis, and we are starting now here in, in uh, on the Swiss Alps uh, uh, in Davos. What we did in, in Minneapolis was to actually drive 45 minutes south of Minneapolis, which is exactly in the middle of nowhere if you've ever been there. But that was great because uh, there was a, um, there is an instrumented site over a very flat region uh, where we could uh, experience conditions of, I would say, standard atmospheric boundary layers. And so to characterize the turbulence in a pretty complete way. So we use meteorological towers uh, as our PIV essentially, because we couldn't do PIV of the turbulence in the air. We used the um, sonic anemometers to uh, characterize the turbulent fluctuations and even uh, uh, back out essentially the, um, the, the structure functions and therefore the dissipation rates uh, and, and from that the cosmograph scales of the turbulence. But then the, the, the meat was really to look at the snowflakes. We use digital inline holography. This was a collaboration with uh, my colleague and friend, Jaron Hong at the University of Minnesota, who is a real expert of uh, digital inline holography. We had this portable system in which we could resolve um, very much in detail the, the shape of snowflakes. And in particular, in this case, we we're looking at a graupel, graupel being this kind of uh, packed, rhymed, uh, um, 
snow particle, which in fact is not that different from a, from a sphere. It's definitely not a dendritic crystal like you would see in a, in a Disney movie. And then we did exactly what we do in the laboratory, which is to shine a bright light sheet, uh, in this case, up in the sky. We couldn't use a laser because you really don't want to uh, get a powerful laser and shine it up in the sky, especially in the US when you're, you're uh, not a citizen. Uh, but even if you are a citizen, you probably get in trouble. Uh, what we use uh, was a five kilowatt searchlight, so a powerful searchlight on a curved mirror that produced a, a, a strong uh, light, uh, light beam that open up in a, in a light sheet with a thickness of about uh, 0.3 meters, so definitely much thicker than the uh, two millimeter sheet you would use in the lab, but very, very wide and very, very tall. And so uh, we would then uh, focus our, our cameras uh, on, uh, on the region of interest, which is now is many meters, seven meters tall by four meters wide in this specific case, and located about 12 meters from the ground. And when we did, did that and we acquired uh, just 120 hertz, uh, we saw this. Um, and well, I hope that the, the, the stream is good through Zoom, but um, if it is, then you should really realize that if you have done, I guess, experiments with particles uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a turbulent facility, you see that this type of data, it really is beautiful data, meaning that it's really data that you would have a pretty easy time uh, treating with the particle tracking velocimetry. And that's just because of how beautifully ref reflective uh, snowflakes are when you illuminate them with a bright light. And so from that, we could get long uh, trajectories uh, and very many trajectories, hundreds of thousands of trajectories, with which we got information about the Stokes number of the snowflakes themselves. Um, of course, it, we couldn't define it based on uh, simple formulas that only valid for spheres of which you know the, the density, uh, because those are not spheres and because we didn't know the density of the snowflakes. But what we could do was to learn from uh, classic studies in uh, particle and turbulence. For example, the fact that uh, as uh, many of you know, the acceleration distribution of inertial particle in turbulence um, tend to have uh, exponential tails that really depend on how inertial the particle they are. If the particle are not inertial at all, then you have these very fat exponential tails, uh, which really depend pretty much only on the, on the intensity of the turbulence. And then uh, these uh, tend to close up pretty steeply as a function of the Stokes. And as a matter of fact, uh, if we take our data, which is the black triangles here, and we plot the uh, PDF of the uh, acceleration normalized by its uh, RMS, you see that the, it falls very closely on this uh, uh, cloud of, of data from uh, literature of homogeneous turbulence with inertia particles. And, and that's for a range of Stokes number, which in fact is relatively narrow, uh, Stokes eta between 0.1 and 0.4. And of course, it, well, in a relative sense, it is a big range, it's a factor of four, but in terms of decades, it locks uh, our estimate of Stokes number pretty, pretty narrowly. Of course, if we believe that uh, the, the, the acceleration behavior of the, of the, uh, Stokes, of the, of the snowflakes is a, a univ univoke indication of, of their Stokes number. But with this answer, so with, this, with this assumption, then what we can do is to say, okay, this is a, our estimate for the Stokes number. And the Stokes number being just tau p over tau eta, we can back out tau p, at least an estimate for tau p, um, based on the Kolmogorov scale that we uh, did use from the uh, anim sonic anemometer on the, on the MET tau. So with an estimate of tau p, we have an immediate estimate of uh, tau pg. So the uh, terminal velocity that these snowflakes should have if the air was, would be perfectly still. And so if you now compare this, uh, this range of settling velocities, it is expected setting velocity in still air with what I really measure, uh, I see something, something interesting. I see that the uh, uh, settling velocity that I observe, which is the, the line distribution here, it is a factor of two or three, uh, even more larger than uh, what I expect the snowflakes to fall at in still air which is in scary good agreement with what we find in the laboratory. And of course, those are estimates with a lot of uncertainty, but it, they do corroborate the, the view that snowflakes do experience enhanced settling, just like uh, inertial particles do. But of course, when you look at uh, uh, particles away from the ground, you are looking at them in a fairly homogeneous turbulence environment. Uh, but that's very different if you look at uh, particles which are very close to the ground. Uh, this is a video that my uh, old postdoc and now faculty at uh, University of Utah, Tim Burke, uh, took uh, very early in the morning when he was taking a, a walk on the frozen Cedar Lake. 
And you can see these beautiful streaks of, uh, of uh, snow particles and ice particles picked up by the wind, uh, wind as the wind shears on the, on the ground. And this, of course, is a very different situation from the uh, high uh, altitude, I would say, turbulence. It's, of course, not an homogeneous turbulent flow. It's another classic problem. is a, a turbulent boundary layer with uh, particles in it and with gravity uh, pointing, of course, towards the wall. This is a problem that has interested uh, film mechanicists since Rouse and Prantl in the 30s and 50s, at least. Um, what they assumed in their theory and what still is considered, the, I wouldn't say the state of the art, but maybe the dominant theory in the field, uh, is that uh, you have equilibrium. So essentially you have a, a zero vertical flux because you have reached equilibrium between the advective flow and the, and the, or the abductive flux in the vertical direction and the uh, turbulent flux also in the vertical direction. Um, you also assume Fickian diffusion. So you assume that the uh, uh, turbulent fluxes of particles can be described by a diffusivity that multiplies a, a concentration gradient. And you assume this diffusivity to be essentially the same diffusivity as the turbulent flow, which in turn you can, you can model with classic theories just as proportional to the, um, to the uh, for camera constant, to the uh, friction velocity and to the uh, well normal distance. Sorry, this should be Z, not Y, that's, that's my bad. I'm taking Z as the vertical coordinate and X as the Stillman coordinate. So this should be a Z here, I apologize. Um, and then the third the crucial assumption is that the steel fluid, the uh, essentially the vertical velocity of the particle is nothing else than the steel fluid and velocity. And if you understood the narrative of this talk today, uh, we're gonna attack exactly that, that uh, assumption. The assumption that particle will simply fall at a tau PG fall speed. Uh, if you assume all of these things, then uh, Rouse and, and Prantl deduce uh, that the, the concentration profile will have this beautifully, uh, beautiful and simple uh, profile, essentially power law uh, that uh, has this uh, Rouse number as a coefficient. Um, with Rouse number is just uh, uh, essentially another version of the SV number. So the ratio uh, or of tau PG, the steel ascending velocity, divided by uh, the velocity scale of the, of the turbine. Now, notice that this uh, beautiful, uh, beautifully simple uh, law has a caveat there. It, it predicts that the concentration becomes infinity at the wall. But I guess that can be just considered a small, a small defect of the, of the theory. Um, we probed this theory though, uh, doing uh, experiments over a broad range of scales, both in a large wind tunnel and in a much smaller, uh, but still pretty interesting uh, open channel flow in water. The wind tunnel on the, on the left is a very large one. The, the, the test section is about 1.7 by two meters, 60 meters long. We, we pushed air at about 15 meters a second. So we, re, we reached the renal style, which is uh, by a landslide, the highest renal style for particle and turbulence study that I know of. And then the, 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 we used our range of, of glass particle to reach a Stokes, Stokes plus. So in this case, I normalized Stokes by wall units of again, a wide range. Um, and the Rouse, the, the Rouse number also covered about the deck. Instead for water, we use a single type of particle, this polystyrene, essentially uh, 0.8 uh, millimeters. And then we have much uh, slower flow velocity. And, uh, and so we are looking at a, small, a much smaller scale. We're looking at a much milder Reynolds style, but still of course, fully turbulent uh, boundary. And then, well, of course, there's many things we, we, have been, we looked at here, but in the interest of time, I just focus on one aspect, which is really the testing of the rouse frontal theory. So as you remember, there are three assumptions here, that the vertif vertical flux is zero, so you are really in equilibrium. And that's really just an assumption on how well you design your experiment, how fully developed you can be in your particle laden flow to reach this, uh, this uh, ultimate equilibrium state. Then the second assumption is the, the, the diffusivity. Uh, well, I guess the Fickian uh, nature of the diffusion, the fact that the diffusivity uh, of the particle is uh, very similar to the diffusivity of the, uh, the momentum, so turbulent diffusivity. And finally, that the vertical velocity of the particles is nothing else than the uh, uh, steel fluid settling velocity. Well, we, we proved the three of them, and we see that, yes, we did reach, uh, uh, these are just uh, different cases for, uh, for uh, uh, one, of the, one of the runs, but just, it just gives you the idea that, yes, we had, a very small uh, vertical flux, uh, I guess less than 1% uh, compared to streamwise flux. So the assumption that we are uh, in equilibrium is, is closely um, uh, verified. The, turbulent, the diffusivity of the particles, which here I'm not showing, but we uh, really estimate using uh, Taylor 1921 uh, theory, um, 
uh, really the diffusivity of the particles show a very close agreement, a strikingly close agreement with the diffusivity of, uh, of the turbulent, uh, of the momentum, essentially, the turbulent diffusivity of the momentum. Uh, so even the second assumption by Prantl and Rouse seems to be uh, holding. But it, what is not tenable really is the fact that the terminal, velo the vertical velocity of the particle would be tau pg. That could be a decent approximation for uh, the outer region, uh, I would say z plus uh, higher than maybe 100. But as you're getting into the logarithmic and the, the, the near world region, uh, really you see that the, the vertical velocity becomes vanishingly small. It becomes essentially zero uh, already for y plus 50 and smaller. So really, if that's the case, then we should look at the first two assumptions and deduce what we can from that. And really, if you simply uh, plug one into the other, you get another very simple relation, which is the fact that the mean, the mean flux, so the mean concentration times the mean vertical velocity is just, a, a, it is a, in a Fikian diffusion relationship with the concentration. But now there is this, uh, this uh, Z there, which linearly uh, relates the left-hand side and the right-hand side. In other words, when Z goes to zero, so when you're getting at the wall, the vertical velocity must go to zero, which is exactly what we see. Um, and I could get into the, physical mechanisms, how the vertical velocity of the particle goes to zero, but that's also something that interests the time I'm, I'm not gonna do. But what I'm going to do is to show that the impact uh, of the uh, theory uh, relying on, on shaky grounds here, it's really, it's really significant. In particular, here I'm showing the uh, Rouse, uh, Rouse Prandtl theory. So these uh, straight lines are just the power law curves that you get from uh, Rouse Prandtl theory for the various cases we have here, which is the various Rouse, no Rouse number that we that we consider. Uh, but now these are the concentration profile that we measure. And as you can see, maybe for a small Rouse number, the agreement is, is good, is even very good. But as you increase your Rouse number, as you look at the heavier falling and in fact more inertial particles, the departure is, is huge and you can be off by easily in a little. All right, so we've done uh, quite a bit uh, with the small uh, spherical particle in the dilute environment, but what about dense concentrations? What about non-spherical particles? Uh, what about particles along free surfaces? Um, I'm really excited because we are doing all of these things, or at least we are uh, looking at doing, uh, looking at in some aspects of all of these processes. Uh, we recently started to look at very dense concentrations uh, um, in, in situations relevant to uh, chemical reactors. Um, with one of my students back in Minnesota, we are looking uh, very closely at the case of uh, uh, non-spherical particles, specifically disk-like particles falling in a quiescent and turbulent air. And then just recently here at ETH, uh, we built a large uh, water chamber in which we, we would generate turbulence and look at the free surface and as a at the bulk, bulk flow as well. And we are also building, as, a, as I speak, a large wind water, uh, wind wave facility to look at uh, momentum and mass transfer and particle transport um, on turbulent and wavy, uh, wavy waters. And that's because we, uh, in our group, really understand how wide, how vast is the parameter space of a particle in turbulence, of course. Um, this is an attempt uh, by uh, my uh, friend, Luca Brandt, uh, KTH, and, and myself to uh, uh, describe in some simplistic way the, the vastity of the parameter space. At least you need particle density uh, or uh, particle density fluid density ratio, uh, particle size and particle volume fraction to describe your, your, your system. And here I'm forgetting, of course, particle shape and I'm forgetting uh, the Reynolds number of the turbulence. And what I show you today is merely a point or perhaps a line in this, in this three-dimensional space. So the ambition, of course, by the community, I believe should really be to uh, unify the, the, the knowledge that we have in, this, in these various regimes. Whereas the community has been focusing in, uh, has been building kind of subgroups that uh, visit very far away regions of this, uh, of this parameter space. Whereas, whereas I really believe that a lot can be gained by bridging, uh, bridging these gaps. All right, um, let me conclude really, really quickly with a couple of, of remarks here. Um, Inertial particles in turbulence don't really fall at the same speed as if there wasn't turbulence. Uh, in these two examples I showed you today, they either fall a lot faster or they almost don't fall at all. And those are canonical flows, homogeneous turbulence and, and, uh, and turbulent boundary layers. Uh, also, it looks like we can use small spherical particles to uh, model or to learn something uh, which is useful for complex natural particles, for example, snowflakes. But of course, so much more needs to be done. In 
this area. Um, and something that I really uh, came to be uh, strongly convinced about is that gravity is such an important effect. Uh, and we all know, and it should be obvious from the equation, but it is pretty common to neglect it in, in, in for example, numerical simulation where you get to neglect it. And I understand the temptation. Uh, I also would like to kill it in, in my lab, but, but I can't. So I'm, I'm really smacking my, my head day after day on uh, how important it is and uh, how risky would it be to, to neglect it and to learn something that you could think is valid uh, if you simply add gravity as if you could uh, use a linear superposition. And finally, I, I wanted to, to, to put some, uh, something on the importance of experiment, but I don't think I can speak better than the Leonardo here, uh, who said that first, I will do some experiments before I proceed, because my intention is to cite first experience and then reason to show why it is bound to behave that way. And again, uh, I don't think I need to add anything to, to what Leonardo said. Um, this is just my, me thanking the great number of fantastic collaborators that over the years uh, have been with me and they are with me uh, in, uh, in the particulate and turbulence side of, of the research in my group. Uh, which is, I have to say, very generously funded by various funding agencies, which, uh, which to me is, is a positive surprise because we really try to do pretty fundamental research. And it's good to see that the uh, um, Department of Defense, uh, National Institute of Health, uh, uh, private companies, and now uh, Swiss agencies seems to be keen to, to uh, look for fundamental insight uh, um, instead of just uh, claiming that it's too far from their, from their agenda. But really, the people I want to thank the most are, are fantastic people in my group, uh, but back in Minnesota. Many of the, of the, the people in this list, of course, have left uh, because they've been the one that uh, they, they, they really show, they really put together uh, the, the beautiful results uh, uh, with which they graduate. Some of them are still with me in my group. Uh, and, uh, and it was amazing to see them going across the ocean, uh, many of them really. And the one that stayed, uh, they kept, of course, being part of the group for, uh, for quite some time be before they graduated. And they basically became friends with people that had they had never met before, because this is the life we, we live in. We live in, and we need to do uh, the best we can. Um, thank you very much, uh, Francesca, and everybody, for your attention. I, I hope I didn't take too much of your time. Thank you, uh, Filippo, for for the very interesting and very detailed uh, presentation. So I would say uh, we can open the the stage for questions directly and. Uh, uh, I remind to the to the audience that you can just like feel free to unmute your mic and ask a question, or you can uh, uh, write in the chat and uh, we can re I can report the question. Uh, so let's see if there's someone who would like to ask to ask a question. So uh, then maybe I can ask uh, uh, first one, uh, uh, could you please share once again uh, mm -hmm. your, your presentation? Because there was, um, um, when, when you talked about uh, the uh, boundary layer, the particles in the boundary layer, uh, you, yes, you actually showed that uh, within a certain uh, distance from, uh, uh from the from the wall the theory seems to the hypothesis done in the theory seem to work quite well yes uh and then afterwards uh they they kind of uh, uh go too far from uh, from experimental evidence which uh seem to call for a kind of uh, potential like uh, matching approach. If you are far enough, mm -hmm. you can use a theory. And if you're close enough, right. then you need to match with something else because the theory blows up. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know if I can find a specific range uh, in terms of uh, Z, in terms of um, distance from the wall where the, where the theory um, works best. It looks like I could for the small uh, Rouse numbers. For the small Rouse number, it seems like things are are, are pretty good uh, in the um, in the outer region, and then they they uh, degenerate near the wall, and that I believe is really a consequence of uh, of that uh, vertical velocity being mispredicted, or simply one assuming a vertical velocity which is in fact uh, much smaller. Uh, but if you look at the higher 
um, rouse numbers. I think I think you can see that the 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 agreement is is, uh, is deteriorating uh, everywhere. I think what is missing there is the inertia of the particles. Um, I didn't mention this, but uh, you can you can see immediately that the, the, there's nothing in the rust planter theory that talks about the inertia of the particles. These particles are meant to be simply uh, essentially tracers with, with gravity on top of them, right? Mm -hmm. So you could, you could think of them a particle with a, a non-negligible SV number, but with a very small Stokes number. And, uh, and that is, I think, the, the essence of the problem uh, that for particles which are uh, little inertial, um, things could go that way, uh, but otherwise, otherwise the theory, the theory breaks down. And the problem is that particles uh, are quickly inertial, uh, especially if the flow is, is intensely turbulent. Okay, okay, that's uh, okay. Okay, thank you. Um, so let's see if there is someone else who would like to, to to ask a question. Just once again, feel free to unmute your mic and. Uh, uh, pose your question. Yeah, Nico, go ahead. Uh, I believe, but I, I, I'm particularly curious about uh, the situation in which particles uh, have a falling speed which is less uh, than. Uh, uh, Nico, what... we didn't hear you from the very beginning. Ah, maybe, okay. you can, maybe you can repeat the first part. So, um, um, my question is about the situation in which particle falls at a, in turbulence at a speed which is less uh, than what we have uh, in a steel fluid. Um, so, the question is in which condition this uh, is supposed to happen and um, did you observe it in your experiments or was it observed in other experiments? Uh, uh, thank you for the question, Enrico. Do you refer to the homogeneous turbulence case or the, the turbulent boundary layer? The homogeneous. The homogeneous turbulence. turbulence. Um, we did not observe a systematic uh, um, decrease of settling velocity. Let me let me bring up uh, let me bring up my screen again. Um, we didn't observe this systematic uh, decrease of settling velocity. Uh, so basically, what we observe is rather I guess this scatter plot will will uh, will do. Um, what we observe is significant settling enhancement, um, and then for uh, for um, for the high um, for the most inertial one, we are probably in the I would say in the in the noise floor. But it, <clears throat> it was uh, observed in in good at all, uh, which someone uh, asked about. Uh, as a reference, uh, this is a JFM from uh, uh, again the uh, Cornell and uh, and uh, um, Cornell and uh, um, Max Planck Institute. So they did observe it pretty systematically, I would say, in their in their experiment. The point is that this is expected, at least uh, some people expect it, for these highly, uh, I would say, fast falling particles. If the particle is falling fast, then it, it can experience loitering. And the loitering is uh, what I uh, was alluding to before, um, is this uh, mechanism by which if you have particles uh, uh, that fall uh, relatively fast, then they, they really spend a long time fighting the um, uh, upward uh, regions of the, of the turbulent uh, gusts, and, and, they, and they speed up through the downward one, but again, of course, this is less time they spend in it. Um, I have to say that in our range, uh, the SV number was probably never high enough uh, to expect that behavior systematically. Uh, what I want to do is, now that we rebuild our chamber here, is to increase the particle size to go around uh, 200 micro maybe. And that should put us in the same uh, area in terms of Stokes number and SV number in which good at all observed um, uh, this uh, reduce, uh, reduced um, settling. I have to say that there are also a bit of not contention. But there is a bit of a debate with numerical simulations. I think the, the group of uh, good at all, uh, 
Collins group did uh, observe it in numerical simulations, whereas uh, Bogdan Rose and Alpine Wang, Alpe Wang didn't observe it. And then, of course, it's DNS, right? So you do expect agreement with the two DNS simulations, but there, there are issues. There could be issues about convergence. There could be issues about the uh, size of the of the domain. Okay, thank you. Let's see if there is someone else who would like to ask a question. Just once again, feel free to unmute your mic or to, to, to ask your question in the discussion and I can report it. Yes, then. Uh, hi, Jean-Philippe, uh, go ahead. Yes, um, thank you uh, for this very nice talk. Uh, I have a question about uh, your PTV, your measurement. On, on which kind of domain are you able to follow the particles, actually? Because <laughs> you have a light sheet, so are you able to, do, to follow the particles on the long trajectories? Or? All right. Uh, of course, not as long as I, as I would like. Um, we find a compromise between the laser sheet thickness, um, which of course you'd like uh, fairly thick to for a bit longer trajectories, um, and uh, but also you would like thin for for high quality PIV. And the, the compromise we find is essentially, I believe, two and a half millimeters. We verify that our uh, PIV doesn't suffer from it, meaning that when we do one and a half millimeter, the, the statistics don't change. But having a two and a half millimeter uh, thickness of the sheet, of the laser sheet does allow for uh, fairly long trajectories. Uh, this the field of view is typically of the order of, uh, uh, I guess, less than ten by ten centimeters. At least if you want to resolve for the zoomed in. Uh, uh, cases in which you want to resolve uh, what, what the scales is maybe five by five centimeters. Uh, instead, if you if you are interested to the in, in the integral scale, you can go fifteen by fifteen centimeters. What helps a lot is is gravity, because the because of gravity, of course, the trajectory is the particle, unlike the one of, for example, a neutrally buoyant tracer. Um, it's mostly uh, or at least is uh, partly aligned with the vertical, and so the trajectories end up being pretty long. Uh, but to give you a reference, uh, we cannot really do, uh, I don't know, Lagrange velocity autocorrelation of the particles. I mean, we do, and we, we we also look at it, but but we only get to a decay from, let's say, one down to maybe uh, 0.8. Whereas, of course, you, you would rather uh, go down to very small value to, to characterize the time scale uh, in a Lagrange sense. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Okay, okay. So let's see if there is someone else who would like to ask a question. I can ask another question. I, I'm um, curious about your uh, system uh, to generate turbulence because it's, it's different from the one that I know normally uh, um, I know a lot of study that generated homogeneous isotropic turbulence in the von Karman flow or also called mm -hmm. the French washing machine in which mm -hmm. the disks are of the size of the system and there are two opposite counter rotating disks. Instead, in your system, you have many, uh, many uh, fans, if I've understood, right. 256. Right. So uh, major difference between the previous experiment and your experiment is that uh, uh, you have uh, uh, potentially access to scale which are larger than the larger scale of turbulence. Right. Um, so I, I would say the following. The, the major difference really is that the homogeneous region in our case is much larger than the integral scales of the turbulence, which I personally consider a, a, an important condition for the turbulence to develop uh, naturally. You know, if you are doing a, a DNS in a triple periodic cubic domain and uh, you are exciting uh, wave numbers which are uh, lower than the ones allowed by the domain, uh, something doesn't work, right? And it's, to me, it's a bit the same uh, if you look at the uh, von Karman flow, which is, of course, a beautiful system, so so easy to implement, so, so rich, and uh, has given so many beautiful results. But what you have there is essentially a system of large eddies sweeping in and out, la very large eddies sweeping in and out of a, a region of homogeneous turbulence, which is much smaller. 
which means that this region of homogeneous turbulence is not free from boundary conditions, right? Whereas in our case, because the large eddies are only 10 centimeters and they decay, the energy decays from that wave number down, um, essentially the, the, the boundaries are not there. Uh, there is nothing uh, that the turbulence knows about the, 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 the walls around it. And, and I, I, I do have some concerns that in a, in a von Karman flow, if you wanna look, for example, at the inertial particles that have a memory of the place they've been in before, uh, that, that memory effect could, uh, could, uh, could, be a, uh, could be a bit of a problem. Yeah, yes, essentially I, I agree. In fact, uh, I, I think this is a main limitation of simulation. In the simulation, we force at the, la at the smallest possible wave numbers, but uh, so we have access only to the cascade, the direct cascade of turbulence, and we do not have access to larger scales. And we right. do see the period, the, the periodicity of, of the box right. so in our system. That's right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, very good. Uh, so uh, let's see if there is someone else who would like to, to, to ask a question. I'll just remind you, you can feel free to unmute your mic if you have a question or uh, just write in the chat. Okay, if not, I um, very briefly I would like to, to, to ask you a, a last uh, question, but it's just uh, not that much about the results, but it's more about the perspective because you show the, uh, like uh, the last slide, one of the last slides you showed uh, an open channel flow with a free surface. So, what is the main target you, you have in mind in that case? Is it like uh, um, having a, a free surface where particles, like having light particles where they can kind of have clusters on the free surface or you're gonna target different uh, source of flows? Um, essentially there we have maybe two, it's, it's really multiple, multiple uh, potential questions that the facility will allow us to tackle because it will have a, um, a wave maker that produces waves, um, but also an active grid that can produce, uh, of course, uh, strong decaying turbulence. But then it will have a wind tunnel above that blows the wind. So essentially we can look at the wind wave interaction. Uh, I like particles and the dispersed flows. So I guess the, the, the main uh, questions we will look at or the, yeah, the chief ones, would be uh, the generation of, of, of spray droplets in the wave breaking events, both driven by shear and just uh, by, by the shear of the wind, but also just driven mechanically. And also the opposite problem, if you want the, the anti-symmetric problem, the one of uh, uh, air bubbles uh, ingested in the water. So these two dispersed flows uh, cleave above and, and below the, the air water interface i think they're of course they've been they've been studied but the, there are very very few facilities maybe two or three facilities active now in the world that really look at them and uh, and uh, the, this is kind of the um, the, the main direction and the, another direction is just to look at the at the uh, transport of floating particles on the free uh, the free surface when you have uh, turbulence uh, underneath and then even if you have no waviness in the flow uh, of course the, the free surface is, is a compressible material surface and so you have clustering that uh, comes from the compressibility of the surface and that is the something attribute you already started to to look at and uh, I will present that in uh, um, definitely this summer in uh, in Athens. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thank you for for uh, the presentation and uh, for replying to to so many questions. Uh, so I invite our audience to to thank our speaker again, and uh, uh, I hope to see you all uh, next week. Thank you, people. Thank you, Francesco. Again, th thanks everybody. It's been a pleasure. Bye bye. Uh, good evening. <laughs>